During this part of the offseason, I love diving into and dissecting second year players. When rookies enter the NFL, Hayden, you have like this idea of their strengths and their weaknesses mm -hmm. and maybe what they can be. But, you know, once they play on the field works and what yep. doesn't, the picture's a bit clearer. And like now we can kind of point to who people might be overlooking or overselling. So that's what today's show is. People love second year breakout wide receivers. They are a staple of fantasy football championship rosters, yep. and we are going to give it to them. The biggest leap happens from year one to year two, um, especially now when these receivers are a little bit more prepared to be NFL players from day one. So yeah, it's going to be a very important show. And then also like year four, year five receivers, we know exactly who they are at that point. So this is right. the show Aside from all the rookies that we just did from this last draft class, this is my favorite offseason show of the year. Uh, I asked you this question last year, and I am curious to see if your answer has changed in any uh -oh. way. Do not prepare you for this. Okay. How much should we hang on to what we thought of these players heading into their rookie mm -hmm. seasons during their draft seasons versus you know, what they showed us as a rookie? I'm still holding on to some of it, but it's going to change depending on the type of player. If I thought that a player was a developmental guy and he didn't sh completely finish his profile yet, I'm still waiting on to that. I'm going to have a little bit more upside moving forward. If a player was really bad and they were really bad as a rookie, <laughs> then I'm going to still think they're going to be very bad. But it's the things that I'm kind of, when I was like watching these guys, did they do something that they weren't doing in college? And like, if right. so, that's when I need to be like, okay, screw my rookie reset everything rookie profile. He's now doing this. Now the whole dynamic of how good of a fancy guy he's going to be has completely changed. Totally. And hopefully you all know and subscribe to the channel when we go through stats versus film, when we go through the Sunday night recap, when we go through hands rankings on a weekly basis, we watch like every single game, but the NFL season kind of be like a bit of a tidal wave when it comes to this stuff. So like, this is the perfect time to go back mm -hmm. and watch and like really detailed singular snaps and games yep. and so on and so forth. With every single one of these players. Okay, go ahead. Yep. That, that's a good point. Cause when you're watching the season, we're, I'm typically watching a full game at a time rather than a player by player cut up. Now in the off season, I'm like, okay, just give me these type of routes that he's running. I'm going to watch those and then right. go to these routes. So you're going to have a way clearer picture just on how you're like taking in your notes here. What you're going to get in today's show dive into advanced metrics, obviously show you the tape of where these guys succeed and where they fail. And to note, we are not talking about Puka Nakua, uh, who is now being drafted as the ninth overall player over on Underdog Fantasy, the home of best ball, because y'all know how good he is. I mean, he is the wide receiver six, yep. ninth overall player. All of these other names that we're discussing are going outside of the top three rounds right now in fantasy football drafts. Last year, we did 10 names. This year, we will crank it up to 11 names and we kick things off with Baltimore Ravens wide receiver Zay Flowers who's going as wide receiver 25 right now Hayden he was the wide receiver 32 last year in points per game and had six top 20 scoring weeks mm -hmm. as a rookie there were some splits with Mark Andrews he averaged 13.2 half PPR points without Mark Andrews that dropped down to 8.2 so a five point gap with that but what i did see from zay flowers he played a lot on the perimeter and he definitely still played down the field as well he remained the screen wide receiver in the ravens offense uh just like he was in boston college so how he was utilized was more or less kind of what i was expecting here the problem with zay flowers remains his size and his complete nuance of route running probably some room for upside with him he only caught nine of his 21 press coverage uh targets this year, there's sometimes we get tossed out of there uh, just by, by a more physical guy. But I think for the most part, he and Lamar Jackson were just not on the same page yeah. at all times. The big thing with Zay Flowers, though, is he is so explosive. He is so <laughs> agile, which is exactly what we saw in Boston College. But is more or less the type of player I was expecting here. I think he's more of a number two than a number one wide receiver. But Mark Andrews could be that kind of like X wide receiver, the slot wide receiver, the number one read. And then Zay Flowers, you can manufacture some stuff too, but also he has the explosiveness to win against man coverage at times as well. You see the burst and explosion on free releases. Yeah. And when he turns to win after the catch, it's exactly what we talked about when Steve Smith came on this program, because I noticed that Steve, when watching him while growing up, that instead of catching and turning and rolling with it, uh, Zay Flowers almost loves to square up, face up, and make yeah. you miss in tight quarters. And from the first game, we saw that. He is best in those tight movements, sitting in those soft areas, that yards after catch, 
translated immediately. I thought on breaking routes as the season went along, especially the rep versus Derek Steenley that we saw against the Houston Texans. He and Lamar, though, as you pointed out, just were not on the same page and especially yeah. on downfield routes last season. He caught 11 of 23 20 plus yard targets last year. And so while he is not a perfect player or a perfect prospect, he did make his mark in certain areas, as we have outlined, especially in sitting in the zone systems and especially with yards after catch capabilities. And as the season went along, legit outside breaking routes. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's still this like untapped area of potential of these downfield explosive mm -hmm. plays if these two with a full off season under their belt working together. And that makes me really more excited than I was kind of expecting to be mm -hmm. before going back and reviewing his tape. And we've seen Lamar not be on the same page with a couple of different receivers throughout their career. Also, this was the first year in a new system, a vastly different uh, system on offense. So maybe there was just the system and not necessarily Zay Flowers or Lamar Jackson in particular. So yeah, I think that he was able to beat man coverage all right. He was better against zone. He's definitely going to be good in the screen game as well. And it's just a couple of those deep downfield targets, a couple of these uh, completions against man coverage that we're both siding here. A couple of those things break his way, and then he can become the wide receiver, too, that everyone's drafting him as right now. That scares me a little bit. Um, right. but I understand that you're at least drafting Lamar's number one. It is pretty amazing that Lamar Jackson won MVP. And about like half of these misses down the field were on Lamar Jackson and half of them were probably on say flowers, either with poor hands or not mm -hmm. tracking the football, all that stuff. We keep mentioning the, the discrepancy slightly just on the eye test with man versus zone zones important though, because mm -hmm. when a defense is facing a quarterback like Lamar Jackson, they're going to run a lot of zone coverage. Because if you run man versus Lamar, you just are terrified of him scrambling in those situations and picking up yep. chunk gains. So I feel like that matches a strength or exactly what this offense is going to run into mm -hmm. quite often. Um, is it fair to say, though, that this build of a player, even in 2024, is not your common quote unquote wide receiver one on an NFL roster? Yeah, I, I would say so. At least they have Mark Andrews, which makes this a little bit like 1A, 1B. I think that he's good enough. It, it, your team, like the, the Ravens are good enough with Mark Andrews and Zay Flowers as their top two receivers uh, receivers on the field. I don't think he's this true X receiver going to get out there and absolutely dice players up against man coverage. They're going to be reliable number one guys. I think there's going to be some questions in the red zone whether or not manufacturing touches for him. So he's not in that exact build. And then someone versus like Tank Dell, who we'll get to, I think there's a little bit more like precision in the way he's trying to run his route and stuff. And this is more or less what I saw at Boston College as well. So he's a fine player. He's a win for the Ravens if you drafted him. But they still, this offense, there were it's Rashad Bateman's the number two again. They're, the guy that they drafted as a rookie this year, you and I didn't think that he was going to be very good. So the Ravens really need Mark Andrews to come back and be healthy because he's, to me, Aside from uh, Lamar Jackson, he's the most important part of this game just because he brings that big body that this offense doesn't have uh, in the past game. But we obviously love the quarterback. We really like the play caller in what Todd Monken showed versus yep. what Greg Rowan previously did on this team. We love the running game on top of it. So this is definitely an area, again, where he's not your prototypical wide receiver one. And despite that, again, as a rookie, 16 games, 108 targets, 77 receptions, 858 yards, five touchdowns, uh, 41 first downs. The other thing is just because they have Derrick Henry and the Ravens are good and they're winning games in the fourth quarter, I think there's also a little bit of a cap to his fantasy ceiling. Just like they're, he's not going to have 150, 160 targets in the season, especially if Mark Andrews stays healthy. So this price tag on underdog, I, I still don't draft Zay Flowers very much just because where he finished last year, even if you are going to throw in, he's going to catch a couple more of those deep targets. I just struggle to see how the projection makes sense there. But Zay Flowers is good enough to make a guy miss and score a long touchdown. So in best ball tournaments, I understand it. But uh, I just think that there's a, a little bit of a ceiling, just like with Marquise Brown when he was uh, this number one option in this game as well. He is going ahead of T. Higgins, George Pickens, just after the likes of like Devontae Smith, DK Metcalf, and yeah. Cooper Cup. And I will say one spot ahead of our next name, that is wide receiver 26 on Underdog Fantasy. Houston Texans wide receiver Tank Dell, 75 targets, 47 receptions, 709 yards, and seven touchdowns in just 11 games mm -hmm. last season. Hayden, that placed him as the wide receiver 16 
yeah. in points per game with six, six top 20 finishes in 11 games. I will say this during the season, I've been a major tank mm -hmm. Dell advocate. You slightly mm -hmm. hesitant to mm -hmm. get to the same level as I've been at. So after reviewing, what are your thoughts now entering year two? Well, the reason why I was a little bit hesitant with Tank Dell is because Nico Collins is an absolute monster, but Tank Dell is, I mean, this guy, he was by far the best. I mean, Puka, I didn't even watch that much Puka Nuku because I know how good he is. Of all the guys that we're going to get to, Tank Dell is, to me, by far the best yeah. of all these guys. He had a 4.49 uh, 40. There is no way that he's that slow. This dude is flying down the field, and what's crazy about him is we talk about, like, tempo in your routes. His ability to absolutely stop on a dime, cut, do a double move, it's an in-breaking move, an out-breaking route. His motion in terms of just the raw speed in a straight line, but also his ability to get in and out of these breaks, to me, is like almost in the special category. Yeah. Now, he is super small. I don't know what he's going to look like coming off of this injury. At least he's running around in May. So was Tony Pollard with the same injury, and he kind of had a slow season coming back. But just based off the tape last year, this guy to me is a really special player. And it wasn't just because he's like 170 back routes and he's a perfect pairing with CJ Stroud who basically didn't miss uh, the entire season. You're watching the highlights right now. You can't name any players who are better at comebacks or outside breaking routes in the NFL, period. Yeah. Among yeah. all wide receivers, doesn't matter if they're third year, fifth year, eighth year, then what Tank dealt it. And it was his first catch of the season. Third and seven against the Baltimore Ravens. Single high, isolated coverage. He threatens vertical, which, by the way, these corners are terrified of as his should be. downfield speed. <laughs> Runs four yards beyond the six, turns on a dime, as you said, which forces the corner to drift another two yards further upfield. The ball is in the air immediately, gain of 10 yards, first down. You see that repeated over and over and over. This threat yeah. of a vertical as an outside wide receiver and pinpoint footwork to turn back to the sideline, it's simply incredible stuff oh, yeah. and it's not just paired with cj stroud it's also paired with bobby slowick because i'm going to pull back these highlights and i want all of you to watch this tape and see where almost all of these routes originate from it is inside the numbers so rather than starting these downfield perimeter routes along the sideline outside the numbers in that alley and then run into trash over the middle of the field or run into coverage, Bobby Slowick is smart enough by condensing everything first and then expanding this post snap because yeah. you're just giving this area for Tank Dell to attack mm -hmm. either down the field or yeah. again, these hitches, these outs, these comebacks along the sideline. And I'm with you where his frame just not going to be a yeah. major factor there and forcing his tackles, but he does such a good job of his spacing and keeping that distance almost like a, a fighter or a boxer mm -hmm. with the corner opposite him. And again, this vertical threat of speed helps with that naturally. Um, that again, a, a, a lack of size, a lack of bulk, a lack of mass did not show up to me as a negative as a route run. I wonder because they run the ball so much in Houston and they get under center. If there's like they rotate a safety down and then the corners are no longer yes. going to play press man coverage. They're going to play off coverage because yes. they're worried about beating deep. And then all of a sudden this problem where, Oh, what if they get your hands on tank Dell? He's not going to be as effective. Well, now that's mitigated just based off the scheme of the offense. So everything, like you said, works perfectly uh, in together. 2.2, yards per route run against man coverage even if you remove the screens and all that type of stuff just winning against man coverage only puka nakua was better among this rookie class and to me it all made sense uh i'll go as far as to say i would be surprised if steph diggs is better than tank dell this year i think that it. steph diggs has fallen off just a little bit and i think that the competition for targets between nico collins who i also think is so so good <laughs> in tank dell it's going to be tough now the big caveat here is what is he going to look like after the injury like we're talking about a super small player who basically broke his leg i don't know but i'm willing to find out i think because the tape was I, I, i'm like struggling to find like ty hilton -y kind of to me um yeah he's really good <laughs> i mean he's really good i love when players break the mold and he definitely breaks oh, yeah. the mold okay. and when they made the trade for Stefan Diggs, I saw people on Twitter suggest that Tank Dell should go into the slot. No, watch him. He is Diggs an should. outside wide receiver and he yeah. doesn't need to be. And we talk about players of this weight more often now, it feels like, than we had to do in the last 10 years and how on these fly motions, these sharp motions, whatever you want to call them, 
it manufactures this space and releases for them. You mm -hmm. don't have to do that with Tank Dell. Like yeah. you don't need to manufacture a release for him because he's already yeah. fantastic at that. And any hesitation that a corner has in off coverage on a double move, he's gone. Yeah. He yeah. is gone. I don't, I don't think they have to do this. He also, I don't think had any screens this last year. If he did maybe like two or three the entire year, like there's the option to like get him involved in that way as well. Like, I don't think you have to, but like there's room for an extra target or two uh, here or there um, in that phase of the offense as well. So, I believe the Houston Texans were 23rd last year in 11 personnel usage at around 60 something percent. We talk about, you know, the system gelling, right? And you just talked about it with how multiple tight end sets might force a safety mm -hmm. to, to rotate down. And this allows for off coverage and this off coverage then allows you to be out routed to death by tank yeah. Dell. By the way, he had 33 first downs on 47 catches as a rookie, partially because of that space that was created. So if you go more into, because we know Bobby Slowick love to do these multiple tight end sets, multiple backfield sets. If you now are mostly a, 11 personnel, three wide receiver team. I'm just fascinated to see what the trickle down is right. for how that changes the scheme almost. Because again, we saw those personnel groupings with two wide receiver sets lead to lots of mass protection or extra protection, deep play action shots. Mm -hmm. And then Nico Collins, Tank Dell, so Noah good. Brown, whoever, just crisscrossing down the field and running yeah. wide open. And that might be a, done in a different way, a different fashion, if they are mostly a three wide receiver set team. I would predict that CJ Stroud is going to have more freedom. They're going to, it's not going to just have to be play action stuff. He's going to have to sit there, go one to two to three in a normal pass game, which he was exceptional at yep. as a rookie. So I think that he's going to be able to handle this. And if they pass the ball more, they're going to score more points. So even if his like per route numbers come down, cause there's more competition with Steph Diggs there. Uh, I think that tank Dell is going to be perfectly fine. Stefan Diggs. Well, I'll just go through where the Texans wide receivers are going right now. Nico Collins is wide receiver 15, Stefan Diggs as wide receiver 17, and Tank Dell as wide receiver 26. He is coming off, you mentioned that fibula ankle injury yeah. that I think most recently people are remembering Tony Pollard going through, albeit at the running back position. I also want to point to Jalen Waddle had a high ankle fibula ankle injury during his final season at Alabama. That was like the final week, I believe, of October, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, and then went out there and had 140 targets uh, during his rookie season with the Miami Dolphins. So yep. not every injury is the same. And mm -hmm. obviously Tank Dell is already out there on the field running routes and doing yeah. good stuff. And he was, I mean, just sensational to watch. It's hard to have three wide receivers in the top, what, 26 uh, in fantasy. Stroud has to be so good for him to make that happen. Yeah. If I was sorting out this ADP, I would move Diggs down to like basically where Tank Dell is. And then I would just keep drafting Tank Dell. <laughs> there was even yards left out there, as crazy as that is with all these pieces playing so well. Mm -hmm. Like he had a deep shot against the Bucks that CJ Stroud missed for like a 90 yard touchdown, another one against the Cincinnati Bengals for a, a 60 yard score. Uh, cannot wait for at least this trio and then this one year rental of Stefan Diggs to see again how they incorporate. Cause I trust all these pieces. I trust all of yeah. these pieces. Only Jalen Hyatt had fewer percentage of his yards coming after the catch. So like when Tank Dell yeah. caught the ball, it was way down the field. It's almost like he's like running option routes 15 yards down the field because of the spacing that you talked about. So it's just like it's unfair stuff, really. Yeah, everything is like pushed five yards further in this offense versus okay. the routes on, on everyone else. Okay, before we go any further, if you are liking what you're hearing, hit that subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up as well. This is second year wide receiver, running back, tight end, and quarterback breakout week. Enjoy the content. And if you enjoy it, you need to go play on Underdog Fantasy, the home of best ball. You've heard us talk about best ball before. If you never played it, play it. Try it one time. All you do is draft. So you can do that 10, 20, 30 times versus that one home league. Okay. Next up, Jaden Reed, Packers wide receiver, going as the 33rd wide receiver on underdog fantasy right now. He was wide receiver 23 in points per game this past season. Aiden, six top 20 scoring weeks. When you went back and watched him, how does that project going into 2024 with a loaded wide receiver room? This is going to be di very difficult. And basically, I have to have two conversations. Where do I like him in fantasy and how good of a player Jaden Reed is? Let's start with how good he is. I thought he was very smooth. He's very versatile. Uh, obviously, LaFleur can do a bunch of different things. There's jet sweeps. There's stuff out of the backfield. He can win from the slot. 
option routes, screens, all that stuff. Jaden Reed is the movement guy in this offense if you're looking to design a touch for him. And then uh, beyond that, I think that he was all right in zone coverage, all right against man coverage. I think that his athleticism looks the part there. There was very few like isolated first read looks to him, which is I think kind of matches up what we, we saw as a prospect. But he is obviously so athletic and he like just his feel for the game is very evident to me so i would understand why the packers are going to keep manufacturing touches for him so to me he was a good player not a great player and kind of in this more manufactured uh way um he's he's better than like the wandale robinsons who are like strictly manufactured oh, yeah. touch player there's like one step above that i think that's kind of where Jaden reed is for me it was a fascinating rookie season because from week 10 on he was the wide receiver 10, wide receiver 11, wide receiver 25, wide receiver 52, wide receiver 8, 19, 4, and 21. I mean, that is super consistent mm -hmm. down the stretch. And I think it's why he is going as the first wide receiver of this loaded Packers wide receiver group. We'll be talking about another one a little bit later on. And just some counting stats for you. 94 targets, 64 receptions, 793 yards, and 8 touchdowns this past season for Jaden Reed. Slot fades, fly motion. I thought it was really good at stacking those slot corners and clearing past them, mm -hmm. slight shove, and then even diving cat fly motion that that McVay Shanahan tree loves to utilize. He was mm -hmm. that guy quite often. Touchdowns over expected model. And as you can see on the chart right here, like he was just doing stuff that we cannot expect to carry over. And it was eight receiving touchdowns. I believe he scored two touchdowns on the ground as well. And it's kind of like chicken and the egg. Obviously he's scoring those because they're trying to manufacture touches for him down there because he's good. But also now they have Josh Jacobs to run at the goal line. So I'm not sure about that. And the big thing is once we got to the fantasy playoffs and this is what scares me, and this is going to be very hard for us to figure out this entire off season is there's four guys. Now we're going to get to Dontavian Wicks in a second here. There are four guys that are very deserving of snaps here. Who is coming off the field? And what happened was Jaden Reed once Christian Watson came back to the lineup and Dontavian Wicks was starting to become a thing. His playing time started falling off a little bit. And now we have a bunch of volume to go around to all of these guys. I don't think there's going to be a full-time player necessarily yep. of these four. And that's going to make it hard to pay off this price tag. So as much as I admire Jaden Reed and I love LaFleur, I love Jordan Love, love the offensive line, the whole situation in Green Bay. It's just too early for me because when we sit here and do the projections on the playing time and once we regress that touchdown uh, number, it's going to be hard for him to kind of pay off this ADP. We will save the maybe reorder. How would you would rank these Packers wide receivers until we get to Dontavian Wicks a little bit later on? Yeah. But just put in context of where Jaden Reed is being drafted right now. I mentioned as wide receiver 33. That's just after Keenan Allen and Terry McLaurin. It's just before Xavier Worthy, Marquise Brown, and Calvin Ridley, right around that like 58th overall but like some players going around him in other positions that i'm drafting a lot of anthony richardson as quarterback six joe mixon as tight ends. running back 15 cal pitts mark andrews yeah. go in that area too so it's it, that's like a sweet spot actually i think in like drafts mm -hmm. right now of like oh i can make a case for all these guys and all of them yeah. hitting in in quite a big way i mentioned the stuff versus man kind of taking until about i thought week 10 week 9 to really hit his stuff versus own i thought was really good yeah. like sitting in the soft areas. And then again, he has like this powerful yards after catch capabilities. He's really good with the ball. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. So I think we saw the same thing. Next up, Jordan Addison drafted right now in underdog fantasy wide receiver 38. He had 108 targets last year, 70 receptions, 911 yards and 10 touchdowns mm -hmm. in 17 games that equaled six top 20 scoring weeks. He finished as the wide receiver 28 overall in points per game you fight on big fan of jordan addison entering the nfl uh everything went a bit off the rails for the vikings offense last year and that maybe kind of factors into our discussion here a little bit what are your expectations now entering year two he is exactly who he was at usc where yes we can nitpick that he's not super fast but when you watch him he's just manipulating the space between him and the corner defending him at all times. And when you have Justin Jefferson, who's going to be facing the bracket coverage, the press man uh, looks out there, you have Jordan Addison on the opposite side. You can win on these huge post routes, uh, some big crossing routes 
as well. And I think that's where Jordan Addison kind of wins. He just toys with these defenders better than most players. To me, he's like more of a veteran styled player than a rookie definitely versus the rest of this class like once we get 15 20 30 yards downfield he is still manipulating guys in ways that very few of the other rookies are able to do i think that there are just size slash speed yeah. limitations to his game which will keep him down probably as a true number two receiver not the number one guy and then there was touchdowns like that where we can't expect him he scored some I mean, some of the most ridiculous touchdowns that you'll see. So that will probably come down, especially with a rookie quarterback. So I don't love him in fantasy, but I think the Vikings hit it out of the park uh, drafting him. There's like a bunch of busts right around him in the draft. I think that he's like a very savvy uh, number two option for the Vikings long term. Yeah. Similar to what we said about Tank Dell, he's a demon versus off coverage. I felt um, my main concern, though, is that I thought his weight and play strength showed up as a negative more often than Tank Dell. Yes. Like the Eagles game, for example, we saw it early on in the San Francisco 49ers game, albeit later on he does snatch that ball away from number seven. Um, I thought his game kind of clicked when just going through and watching all of his targets against the Kansas City Chiefs. And then again, he faced a ton of contact against his 49ers team. But just like the number of corners that stuck in his hip pocket on crossing routes, I thought was a bit alarming at times. Yes. Like if I can put myself in the head of Kevin O'Connell. He even, he even said this once drafting him. The main goal of Jordan Addison was, hey, we need someone on the outside or the slot that when Justin Jefferson is getting bracket coverage like he was against the Detroit Lions or getting extra attention versus these defenses, we need to have someone that can just like win their one-on-one -on -one matchup. Mm -hmm. And from that mindset, I understand why Jordan Addison was a selection for him. And I think he can be like a beneficial and productive player on top of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, do I think that he can like transcend that role? Can he like make it so this team has two wide receiver ones or like be as productive back in the day in the Vikings where it was like Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen on the same season? I don't know if I see that level of talent, mm -hmm. but as like a, oh, this is a solid wide receiver two that's going to do his job. Yep and execute in a well-coached offense with great play calls. Yep. That's what I saw when watching Jordan Addison. And he's got inside and outside versatility. I do wonder if he's going to play in the slot a little bit more just based off of uh, the way the wide receiver group now in Minnesota shakes out. So, yeah, I, I think that like spending a first-round pick on like a like a, definitely a number two receiver is kind of like up in the air. High but floor, not, low ceiling. Yes, but... I understand it. When you got Justin Jefferson, just like surround him with enough and then they'll be able to figure this thing out. So, uh, yeah, I think he's he's not going to be like a game breaking player in fantasy, um, especially when Justin Jefferson's healthy um, and those touchdowns are not going to be the same. So he's another player who I like his tape, but I'm not drafting him in fantasy, really, because the ADP is too high uh, for my liking. Yeah. And if we can think back to, again, the narrative of last season for the Minnesota Vikings, it was Justin Jefferson getting hurt. And so Jordan Addison almost stepping into that wide receiver one-ish mm -hmm. role. And then once Jeff Justin Jefferson was coming back, it was all the quarterbacks get hurt. So yeah. you went through the cycle that included Nick Mullins and Jaron Hall and Joshua Dobbs, and that does yeah. nothing for a wide receiver who works on timing routes and things. No. Again, I, I did sit back and just question it with all these names, but especially Jordan Addison. Like, how can he level up his game? You know, like, what is the area improvement? Mm -hmm. And is it just, like, precision that creates, like, slightly more separation against yeah. man coverage on, like, these really detailed top-end yeah. route runners? Because, again, I think against zone, he's, like, pro-ready in, yep. in that area. But, like, when he is going against a bigger faster corner yep what's his card that he pulls and i yeah. don't know if we have that answer yet he's got to like really win against yeah. the releases because once they're in the pocket it, they're staying in the pocket so um that would probably be the one sign just to put into context where he is being drafted right after calvin ridley and roman dunze and before some rookies like lad mcconkey and keon coleman as wide receiver 38 okay next Jackson Smith and Jigba of the Seattle Seahawks being drafted the home of best ball right now, underdog fantasy as wide receiver 43. He was wide receiver 60 in points per yeah. game last season. One top 20 finish. We know he was the number one wide receiver drafted in the 2023 NFL draft. So with all that in mind, a new play caller in town, 
What are your expectations for JSN after reviewing his tape? He's so much better than his numbers were last year. Like it, it truly was like not even close. His ball tracking, I thought, was very good. He definitely made some plays in the back of the end zone near the sideline, but there's some of these slot fade looks that he would get and that he was really good at that. The other big thing that he does really well, he's kind of like Jordan Addison, like where to me, he's like very much a veteran, like immediately. He comes back to the ball, like on these comeback routes. He's coming back to the wall. He's a very friendly uh, receiver to throw the ball to there. It's just unfortunate because I do think the same thing we're, we're talking about with Jordan Addison. I'm not sure if he has the, that next level to where he can be the number one option. Maybe if you're really lucky, you get Keenan Allen, but Keenan Allen was just exceptional and bigger than, than JSN. Um, so he never, he was never running away from guys uh, on these crossing routes. 26% of his targets were screens. He can play on the outside just a little bit there, but for somebody that was drafted as high as he was there yeah. to me is a, a cap to what he's going to be, but he also was not his numbers as a rookie. It's somewhere in between those yeah. two things. So I would like to see them in this offense because I think he showed a little bit more downfield ability because of his ball tracking. And I think that he's going to have more opportunities to kind of showcase that, especially if Tyler Lockett misses some time uh, this season. Um, so he's a good player. I'm just trying to figure out how he's going to be like that legit number one yeah. guy. This is a fascinating conversation because I agree with a lot of what you said and want to dive into a couple of those topics even more. First, the downfield ability. He started running downfield a bit more often in week 11 last year against LA Rams. We saw it turned up another notch in week 13 against the, the Dallas Cowboys. But before that, he was like this team's manufactured touch, yeah. wide receiver screen stuff. And as you said, I'll use a different term. He's a one speed player. And I don't think like that powerful after the catch, that dynamic no. after the catch. So I don't know if it was, hey, we have these injuries and weaknesses along our offensive lines. We're just going to get the ball in this guy's hands as quickly as possible. But that's also kind of setting him up not to fail in a lot of ways, but not like accentuating mm -hmm. what he does best. Because I actually thought he was quite good on that ball tracking and that vertical ability down the field. I think the big picture, though, is what you talked about where, hey, if what is this next level he can get to to be like, oh, he was the 2023's wide receiver one, and now he's the wide receiver one on an NFL team because I see like a fundamentally sound route runner who can post big production on a big time offense, mm -hmm. but on like an average offense or worse, which you can kind of argue the Seattle Seahawks were last season. It can be tough to like pop yeah. up or stand out because of that. And I think the common, the common comparison of ev if everything hits is like Amon Ross St. Brown. But again, yeah. let's remember that Amon Ross St. Brown is in one of the best offenses in the league with one of the best play callers in the yeah. league. And I would say just like more powerful and like a bigger competitor after the catch a little yeah. bit from what we've seen so far. I agree. But on top of this, Hayden, you and I big Ryan Grubb fans, you know, this right. is more of an aggressive downfield attack, attack, attack style offense. Mm -hmm. And so I am quite intrigued to see how mm -hmm. JSN fits in that versus what we just saw him with a now departed offensive coordinator. There's kind of a dead spot in best ball drafts where JSN is drafted like in the 80s. And I've been drafting him there. It's a little bit of a discount versus the Jordan Addison types that go and the Jaden Reeds ahead of him. And I think that he's just as good as those guys, if not better on tape. I think that the hard part's always just gonna be because Lockett's so good, DK Metcalf is so good. Is there enough balls to go around? I think there's a chance that Tyler Lockett is starting to trend this way, and then JSN just completely overtakes him this year and then if we get the ryan grubb more downfield passing attack then all of a sudden jsn can pop and in particular about this ryan grubb offense they would move romo dunze inside you would see jalen polk move inside and then they would run these big slot fades geno smith can throw that ball perfectly oh, yeah. and i think jsn has the ball tracking ability like some of the washington receivers that we saw uh in college this last season so there, there to me there could be a great match between grub and jsn but if you're looking at the a dot or the percentage of his targets that were screens you're like this is a manufactured touch guy i'm with you he does not have the shiftiness the burst the the strength to win that way to me it's the ball uh, the ball tracking his ability to stop and kind of toy with these defenders uh and he's got like a, a nice frame to come back to the ball so 
I would like to see him, the way that Shane Waldron and Ryan Grubb used him Switch completely it. changed. Yeah. 32 of his 93 targets this past season were behind the line of scrimmage. That's nice. just like, that's ridiculous, you know? And in fact, like going back to his Ohio State days when he was running in a trio of really top quality guys, it was working over the middle of the field, no wasted movement, yep. that catch and run in mm -hmm. one singular motion. But again, it's that one speediness of, of the entire thing. 49 of his 93 targets were out of the slot. Uh, Shane Waldron loved to get creative with multiple different personal packages. We saw it with the sidecar stuff with the tight ends and the running yeah. backs. I don't know if he like totally understood how to utilize three either highly paid or highly drafted wide receivers. Guess what? Ryan Grubb does. Like yep. we saw Roma Dunze, Jalen yeah. Polk, and Jalen McMillan all have important yeah. periods and games and seasons for this team. Okay, to finish out with your point, DK Metcalf is going as wide receiver 23 right now. JSN is wide receiver 43, and Tyra Lockett as wide receiver 52. By the way, Lockett 26 spots after where JSN is going right now. Because of that, and because it's almost like a dead area of the draft, I am still selecting a lot of Tyra Lockett, especially with this vertical mm. ness of this team. But if we are talking about just number of targets, I can see what you said of can JSN just surpass Tyra Lockett on that? And by how they're being drafted, it's already expected that that yep. happens. I draft so much Gina Smith uh, <laughs> on underdog right now. So I'm drafting all these guys. I like Metcalf's yeah. price in this offense. Like to me, I, I want to get as much exposure to Ryan Grubb. Very fast paced, very pass heavy, very downfield pass heavy. That's how you win in fantasy. Yeah, and I love getting comments from you guys on Twitter. Someone mentioned to me that Ryan Grubb in his last two spots uh, under DeBoer and someone else, I can't remember, had like two very different offenses. And so like which one is going to bring to Seattle? I would say the one that they just... The one that works. The championship <laughs> one. And, you know, they have three wide receivers and now they have three wide receivers and a guy who throws the ball down the field and lets it rip. Yeah, You know, there's a lot of similarities, I think, between these two teams. I looked up uh, doing research on uh, the quarterbacks. Geno Smith, since he was became the starter in 2021 or 2022, he's number one in completion percentage over expected across the entire league. Like the dude just puts it on the money constantly. Next, Kansas City Chief, Rashi Rice being drafted as wide receiver 47 right now on underdog. He was wide receiver 30 in points per game this past season. Five top 20 scoring weeks. That equal just some raw numbers, 102 targets, 79 receptions. 938 yards and seven touchdowns. Let's stick on the field to the on the field part to okay. open this conversation with. What did you see and what type of player do you think Rashi Rice will be whenever he does touch the field in 2024? I think how he was used last year was exactly what the Chiefs needed once everything else wasn't working. I mean, Travis Kelsey didn't look the same in the regular season. Obviously, the Kadarius, Tony, Sky Moore, all those guys, it wasn't going to work. He's bigger than this manufactured touch type of profile is. And his athleticism after the catch, it is real. And like you see, like the yards after the catch numbers Gosh. are legit for a reason. Now, to me, he's a manufactured touch player. Like, if you yeah. want to think that he's like a number one receiver, or if I know everyone after the rookie season, if you had 2.0 yards per route run, now all of a sudden you're going to be a pro bowler. I just don't see that with Rasheed Rice. If you go sit back and watch all of his targets, so many of them were pick plays, screens, meshes, where he's getting basically like free releases, or the guy that's guarding him is getting completely taken out by another guy. And that's because Andy Reid is so good at this. And a lot of the time, it was, and this is a credit to Rasheed Rice. He was very good on broken plays because he's a little bit bigger than the other receivers that the Chiefs were trotting out there. So when Patrick Mahomes is running around scrambling, which he's like basically the best quarterback in the NFL at that, and still looking to pass, Rasheed Rice was getting production off of that as well. Very rarely did I see him win on a first read target or down the field. If you're going to be the number one guy in an offense, I think you need to at least be able to do one of the two of them. In particular, you probably need both of them. I didn't see that. I think that. Yeah. Hollywood Brown is a better player. I think Xavier Worthy is going to be a better player. So when Rasheed Rice does come back from this likely suspension, I don't think that he's going to get the same usage as he did last year in terms of like total volume, just right. because I think he's going to be more of the manufactured touch guy like they were trying to get with Kadarius Tony a couple years ago. I think the question of do the Chiefs expect Rasheed Rice to evolve his game 
was kind of answered by the moves that they made this offseason with Marquise Brown and with Xavier Worthy, who are more intermediate and mm -hmm. downfield types, right? Because mm -hmm. if they expected Bryce to take it up a notch and run like legit big boy routes, multiple mm -hmm. breaking, outside the numbers, down the field, so on and so forth, then they, you know, might have anticipated that a bit more often. I mean, he's just 5.3% of his targets were 20 plus yards on the field. The only other player with 50 plus targets last season with that low of a percentage was 33 year old Adam Thielen. Um, yeah. You know, I do want to give the Chiefs credit though, and a little bit of rice on the field, that this is the definition of having a plan for a flawed player and like sticking to it and it's succeeding. You get it to him on the move out of a stack or off motion, and then you run after the catch. And mm -hmm. again, we saw maybe 10 like legit routes a and year. that's an exaggeration. Yeah. Like, and week 12 against the Raiders week 14 against Buffalo. Again, that's like when the actual wide receiver stuff started popping up, then they kind of still went back to it. And that was more like the exception and not the rule of Rashi mm -hmm. Rice. And it's because early in the season, man, you saw total indecision on downfield routes, like a child not knowing if they are allowed to cross the street or not. And like yeah. looking back at their house and their parents are like yeah. doing something that they're doing for the first time. It looked like Rasheed Rice was doing that down the field. And then, as you said, we've heard from James Palmer suggesting that they're expecting, you know, anywhere from four to six to half a season, so on and so forth. The off season is still early for Rasheed Rice. Let's put it that way. There's a long yeah. time until training camp. So yeah. exactly what you said, where, I believe unless something magically happens from year one and year two, there's like this pixie dust of evolution of a player that he learns how to run routes on the field, that he will be the same type of underneath yak player. And that can be successful. It just, mm -hmm. I don't think will be as the peak successful as it was last year because they have more options in 2024. There are a lot of people that just look at the, the spreadsheets and think that Rishi Rice is like, has earned these targets. It's going to be one of the best receivers in the league. I will be surprised. And Mahomes was going to get his regardless. Like at some point, Mahomes was going to throw the ball to somebody and somebody was going to be productive last year. That was Rasheed Rice. But yeah, I'm with you. I think some of that indecision down the field, like to me, also you saw with the playing time in the early in the middle part of the season, he was clearly the best option that they had in the receivers and he still was not a full time player. Why do you think that was? Probably because he didn't have a good grasp of what was going on in the offense. Then you fast forward to this offseason. Then now you kind of have an understanding of maybe who Rasheed Rice is uh, in total. So, um, and then yeah, quickly on, on the suspension stuff, it's eight felonies. Like maybe a couple of them get priced down to misdemeanor offenses, but it's it's a big deal. Like Ray Rice and Alvin Kamara, that's like one felony. Right now it's eight. So I, I think that we're looking at six game suspension. We had this incident at the nightclub. No charges are being pressed, but in the police they, they report, were dropped. They were dropped. They, they were dropped. Somebody got a bag yep. in the police report. The guy said he had visibly swelling on, on his face. And that was a quote misunderstanding. I don't know how that happens without somebody getting paid here. And by yeah. the way, the NFL and the commissioner's list, they don't have to have a police report to put you on the exempt list where you're not, where you're basically paid, paid leave or for the suspension, they'll factor in everything. So it's not looking good for Rashid Rice right now. Yeah. I, I mean, I know some of you hate it when, you know, we get in our soapbox and say like, oh, I don't like this or, you know, anyways, I think it's really dumb when people drive fast and race in cars because those can be like deadly weapons when you yeah. lose control of them like they did in this scenario. It was dumb when Jordan Addison got caught going 100 plus miles an hour during his rookie year. And it was really dumb that it was caught on footage and they actually did it uh, here with Rasheed Rice. So he's going as wide receiver 47 right now. That is after DeAndre Hopkins, Christian Watson, and still ahead of Jamison Williams, Curtis Samuel, Cortland Sutton. Obviously, that ADP is dropping like a stone right now. You've always talked about it. it's more difficult for someone to drop than climb. Where do you think it might settle? Or is it just kind of impossible to even predict that until we know how many games he's going to miss? I think, let's say it's around six games. It could be four. It could be eight. Somewhere in there. I think once we get the final suspension number, he'll probably slide into the low 100s. And I think at that point, that would make some sense. That's where I have him ranked right now. But I think that we're still, this thing's still right. trending one direction. The NFL does not, just because that this this last incident was dropped, that does not mean that the NFL is still not looking into this and that it will still not apply uh, to his upcoming suspension. And again, even on top of the suspension, if he stays the type of player as he was last year, that was the peak of the opportunity that I think is going to come from it. I mean, he didn't have a catch of 20 plus yards mm -hmm. target 
until week 17 yeah. last year. Next, Colts wide receiver Josh Downs. Drafted as wide receiver 63 on underdog fantasy right now. Wide receiver 58 in points per game, Hayden. That equaled two top 20 scoring weeks. Some raw stats to throw at you. 17 games, 98 targets, 68 receptions, 771 yards, and two scores. We really liked Josh Downs coming out of North Carolina, a small guy who plays with a larger frame. Uh, right. What would you think about him after reviewing him? He might have been the guy that looked exactly like his college profile <laughs> and the pros than anybody else. Like to me, there's a couple things that he does well. First of all, he's like an option route killer. He's not manufactured touches in the screen game. On occasion, they will say, go win on an option route catches. There's some plays in traffic on occasion with Josh Downs. He's excellent in zone coverage, which is like 70% of dropbacks uh, in today's NFL. And he's really good on broken plays. Now, there's a limit to what Josh Downs can do because of his size and his explosive ability. But as a number three target or a number two target, if you have to, in the pass game, I think that Josh Downs is perfect for that. So to me, like Michael Pittman, flanker, zone read, first target guy, A.D. Mitchell, all speed, vertical X receiver, and then Josh Downs as a slot. Like to me, that's building a basketball starting lineup right. in the for Anthony Richardson uh, in the three wide receiver set. So to me, he's like exactly who I thought he was going to be. Not going to be special in fantasy, not going to be special for the Colts, but like a very cool uh, winning player from the slot. We talked about with the Texans where you can kind of mix and match and use players in different ways. Same thing with like Ryan Grubb at Washington, some guys yeah. in the slot sometimes, sometimes out wide. I mean, with Indianapolis Colts, their three wide receiver roles yep. are so defined. Yep. And that that's good. Like, we yep. like when it's very clear and how they're going to be utilized in the league. As you said, he has obvious quickness. He's an option route savant. He changes his pacing on underneath stuff versus man. He's a zone sitter. We know he can play bigger than his frame. He did that with Drake May at a very high level during North Carolina. I think my big question comes to, hey, we saw him in like just two plus games with Anthony Richardson during his rookie year. We know that Shane Steichen kind of tailored down and changed his offense to what Gardner Minshew did well, if you want to put it in those terms. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to look different. This offense is just going to naturally look different with Anthony Richardson. And by that, I mean more down the field stuff. And I am not calling Josh Downs, Ricky Pearsall, but Ricky Pearsall played a ton of slot with Anthony Richardson at the University of Florida. And that year, his A dot, even out of the slot, was 17.3, mm -hmm. and 55 of his 63 targets were 10 plus yards down the field. So, like, that is very different than the everything 10 yards and in stuff that we got mm -hmm. with Gardner Minshew last year. I don't think it's going to be to that same degree where they're pushing it down the field over and over and over again. But I do think Josh Downs has the more intermediate to downfield capabilities than a lot of these other pure slot wide receivers that yeah. we see across the league or into the league every single year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's totally fair. I think he's for a slot receiver, he might be a little bit more better in best ball league because so many of these zone or RPO looks are going to go to Michael Pittman who wins underneath, which is unfortunate for Josh Downs. Cause there's a little bit of overlap in like where those two guys win over the middle of the field. Obviously Anthony Richardson and Jonathan Taylor are going to run, especially in the red zone. So it's a little bit hard for me to see a full breakout from Josh Downs. Um, but yeah, some of these downfield looks that with Anthony Richardson, I think would be successful with jo Josh Downs, even though he is an uh, undersized uh, receiver. The, the, the saving grace potentially, though, is the Colts ran a lot of plays. And, and they will continue to. And at some point, maybe we just say, all right, there's a 10 target game. We weren't expecting that. But all of a sudden, he had a 10 target game because the Colts ran 70, 75 plays uh, in that outing. So, um, yeah, there's a cap. A lot of these guys, this entire class, there's a cap to like what I'm expecting from him. But he's another player that I think is a successful guy. Um, and I think he was, what, a third round pick? He kind of yeah. slid an, an extra round versus where you and I thought he should have gone. And I think that's a, a total smash. We keep mentioning underdog fantasy. We keep mentioning best ball. Producer Weaves is going to throw a map on the screen right now. If you're in one of these highlighted states and you have never played best ball before and you've heard us spout about it every single summer, now is the time to do so. It is early in summer of drafting. As you can tell, these ADPs are going to change drastically throughout the summer. Start now. Do 10 drafts. Do 20 drafts. Click the link in the description down below. 
will give you some money back on your first deposit. I guarantee you're going to love the platform because it's so much fun to play on. And you're just going to love doing drafts over and over and over again, walking the dog out in the backyard in the grill, all that, you know, suburban life that we love. Yes. Okay. Next up, Packers, Don Tavian Wicks, drafted oh right now as wide receiver 65 on underdog, which is fitting because he was wide receiver 65 in points per game last season. Hayden one top 20 finish in 15 games last year, 58 targets, 39 receptions, 581 yards and four touchdowns. We didn't even have a video on Dontavian Wicks heading into his rookie season. He was part of that and still is young wide receiver group with the Green Bay Packers. Uh, but as the season went along, you saw production. You saw him get his moments. What did you think when going back and reviewing Wicks' game? He's He's got the chance to be very good. I think he has more upside than a lot of the guys that we just talked about. He reminds me of me on the dance floor. Big guy, could bend, <laughs> nice releases. Not necessarily explosive, but really has a good feel for the floor. And Wicks is just all versatility. He was even used as the motion guy right at the snap. He mm -hmm. actually was used like Puka Nakua, mm -hmm. which is coming from the same exact offense. LaFleur had a plan for him, but when the Packers didn't have a manufactured touch here, I thought he was probably the best out of all of the Packers wide receivers at just winning by himself. He's got great releases. He's not necessarily going to run away from you on these crossing routes, but there was on occasion, he was able to create so much separation initially where it was enough to work with. And he's a huge guy. Yeah. I mean, this guy has, he's got the frame to like really look like a number one wide receiver. They had to kind of slow play his playing time. Then once Christian Watson got out of there, he became a full-time player in the playoffs was not a full-time route runner out there. But to me, he wasn't necessarily the X receiver because Romeo Dobbs handled a lot of that stuff. I think there's a chance that he can tr turn into the number one option in this pass game. Is that going to happen in, in year two? We'll see. But there's at least like a ceiling that we can chase. Uh, and this is an offense where I want to be chasing some ceilings. This can be a dangerous statement to make for a guy that on May 22nd, we're not even sure he's going to like locked into 80% of snaps on his own team. Right. But what a baller, man. I yeah. mean, he has release shiftiness. He has downfield juice, his agility and quickness to break off his routes. And he has massive hands and length to win through contact yeah. at 6'1", 206 pounds. The man can get down the field and he attacks the middle of the field. He attacks the sideline. He sits in zone. He wins versus man and versus zone. It's like a lot of driving to the heart of the defense and turning back in this 15 yard Canyon that the floor has created over the middle of the field. And then Jordan Love rips it to that section. And then he even has, as you pointed out, yak confidence on plays where he is the fly motion guy. If Jaden Reed wasn't the guy in pre-snap motion, full speed behind the line of scrimmage, guess mm -hmm. what? It was Dontavian Wicks. Yeah. Question, Hayden, how does the floor take this guy off the field? Because he might know. have been the most consistent wide receiver, not production-wise, but like right. series in, series out, I'm going to win intermediate and down the field of this great quartet of wide receivers that the Packers had. Romeo Dobbs took a lot of the isolated wide receiver Difficult snaps. Stuff. Yes. And we'll see if Dontavian Wicks can do that because Romeo Dobbs was very inconsistent in that style. But compared to Christian Watson and compared to Jaden Reed, if they are going to say, yeah, guess what? Romeo Dobbs, your playing time is getting cut in half this year. Who's going to be out there on the, the tough stuff? It's going to be Wicks. It's not going to be Watson. It's not going to be Reed. To me, the fact that he is the fourth receiver and most importantly, the gap is as big as it is. Like why I don't like Massive. drafting Jaden Reed is because I like Dontavian Wicks. It's going to be hard though because they kind of win in different ways. Uh, I think that Christian Watson is a little bit of a manufactured touch guy, but obviously tons of speed. Romeo Dobbs way better versus zone than man coverage, but technically does the most difficult stuff. I think there's a chance that who's going to do all of it at a pretty good level. To me, it's by far, it would be Dontavian Wicks. So um, I don't, I didn't know much about him coming into the league, but like you turn on all of his targets in a row and you're like, whoa. I mean, I remember towards the end and again, it can be difficult after watching full games and then for you having to rank like 60 wide receivers to like take every single one. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'd be like, Hey, where, what about Don Tavian Wicks? And it's just gotten to this point now where again, this is the perfect time this summer to go back and, and watch all these guys. Yeah. I do think situation is like an important part of this conversation, you know? So let, let's talk about that. So Jane Reed, as we outlined, wide receiver 33, that's 58th overall right now on our dog. Christian Watson, wide receiver 46, 
84th overall. Romeo Dobbs, wide receiver 53, 112 overall. And then Dontavian Wicks, wide receiver 65, 138 overall. I just think naturally, like if we are ranking the talent of that wide receiver room, that needs to be reorganized. Like yes. Dontavian Wicks should not be fourth. On, be one. on talent, I think he's the best out of all Ooh. four. I mean, I I love that. The question is, is LaFour going to go out there? Because I even went back and watched our Christian Watson section and segment of this very show last year. And let's remember, during that rookie year with Aaron Rodgers, he had this unreal span of multiple yeah. touchdown games that was on exactly where he won of these vertical out athlete you down the field right and when the injuries hit this year and that didn't hit as well and that first half of the season no one knew what they were doing in that young wide receiver room he kind of went by the wayside but we still have like that area where he wins and you've outlined romeo mm -hmm. Dobbs too i just don't see how don Taven wicks isn't either one or two of the snap percentages if yeah. we get the same player that we got last year yeah and i, I think that they're they're expecting more from Dontavian Wicks this next season. Probably caught him by surprise. And now they're like, wow, we have to get this guy in the rotation. Now, when the playoffs came in and Christian Watson was healthy in those games, Dontavian Wicks was not, not not even a halftime player in those games. So, like, that's the tricky part with that's fantasy. That's my concern. Like, like, is, is this a play caller frame of mind where he's like, man, all these teams around the league are investing in wide receivers every single year. Let's not even, like, not mention Bo Melton, who had moments last <laughs> right, year, too, yeah. right? Yeah. And he's like, okay, I have four of these dudes. Why not just rotate them instead of just plugging in the same three over and over and over or the same two when I want to run Tucker Craft and Luke Musgrave at the same time? In redraft league, Dontavian Wicks, you would draft him and he would be sitting on your bench. And then once we get the answers to the test or one of these guys gets injured, now we can put Dontavian Wicks on the starting lineup. And then in best ball, we don't have to sort that out. We're not trying to project who's going to be in there. So I think that Dontavian Wicks, like, better in best ball God. Like, I mean, this guy can win down the field in the red zone. And all of a sudden we're, we, ha we need a little bit of uh contingent upside of what based off an injury to one of these other three guys. I think we got a chance and just Christian Watson prone to some injuries there. And I think in terms of just raw talent, I would put Dobbs last, but the, it's a difficult conversation just because it's, it's not putting your three best wide receivers out on the field it's not as easy as that like romeo dobbs against press man coverage he's a, he's a snap eater so we'll see what happens there i'm going to be grinding these these training camp reports though for green bay because i i'm i'll put lafleur top three offensive play callers in the in the league and i have a lot of faith in jordan love in this offensive line so like i want to draft as many of these packers as possible in best ball yeah it, this offense is really fun where their stuff just talk about the passing game near the line of scrimmage where it's like LaFleur, you can tell on his whiteboard, manufacturing space and opportunities for certain guys and getting the matchups that he wants. Yep. And then there's like this canyon of space. And then it's like, okay, towards the end of the intermediate, like 15 to 17 yard range or further down the field. Mm -hmm. Like those are the two areas he's attacking. Yep. Either I'm designing cool shit near the line of scrimmage or we're going to take the top off of you and let it rip down the field and everything else doesn't really matter. It's like, yeah, go going to be running those routes. I don't think that that's necessarily gonna be Romeo Dobbs game either. Like what if like all of a sudden Dontavian Wicks is the answer to that part of the field? Cause there, there was plays against a uh, sl slot route or slant routes from the middle or from the perimeter where he was just winning in those. So, so base basically to whittle this down right now, he's being drafted as a distant fourth among this quartet. We want to be drafting him a lot at this moment because while some people might be concerned about how the range of outcomes could be on all these guys, we can run to it and embrace it by investing in the one that we think is an awesome talent while still not having to pay a massive price on it yeah. versus you're having to pay a much more difficult price mm -hmm. on the other three. Yeah, it's like almost like drafting the backup running back in an elite offense where you're like, if this guy, if the starter misses time, I've got an absolute smash in the starting lineup. I think that's kind of how I'm viewing Dontavian Wicks. Yeah. I mean, just, I don't see how you take him off the field. He came out of nowhere, man. Like, <laughs> going through this list, I was, Packers like, fans, him, I was like, woo. Packers fans love him. They think he's like yeah. the best cup seeker in the league. And right. sorry, we're here to, to call him out a little bit. Yeah. So we go from that over to Chargers wide receiver Quentin Johnston. Wide receiver 66 right now, just one or two spots yeah. after Dontavian Wicks on underdog. He was the wide receiver 89 
last year in points per game. Zero top 20 weekly finishes. So we talked about how this draft class actually played out. JSN was the first wide receiver taken, and then Quentin Johnson was the next one, ahead of Zay Flowers, ahead of Jordan Addison. The negatives, the issues, the concerns are well-documented right. during the season. When going back and watching them, were they just as prevalent to you? Where is the athleticism? Like that was like kind of the the point of Quentin Johnson in the first round is like he's got the size and the speed to be an outside player that can win down the field. Well, what happened to me, and this is kind of what I saw at TCU when I was not a big fan of him coming out. Same. There is a predictableness to his route running and NFL corners were just not scared of him just running right by him. So when you're watching Quentin Johnson, like try to come out of his breaks or like just prepare to settle down and come back to the ball, like the corners are like three steps ahead of him. Yep. And then on top of that, there were some drops down the field. Um, the Chargers, I don't think it did a great job. It kind of looks like, all right, you're playing X receiver, get on line scrimmage over there and go try to win. And he was not prepared for that as well. There were definitely some routes where he would just be completely erased from the get go. But to me, like the big thing that he has to solve here is you got to play like you're a four, four, five guy at six foot three or whatever he was. And he, there was no instances of him doing that. And if you go back and watch his best plays at TCU, especially against in that Michigan game against Harbaugh, ironically, it was like broken plays or a blitz that didn't get home or a blown coverage. And he was just wide open. And then like he ran into the end zone very rarely at TCU. In my opinion, was he like winning against press man coverage, creating a ton of separation and really like toying with, corners like i didn't see that in tcu i didn't see that with the chargers and i guess we'll have to see if they're gonna prepare him this next season at 17 games last year 67 targets 38 receptions 431 yards and two scores uh he has real issues creating space and then he has real issues in contested situations <laughs> tough <laughs> tough, <laughs> like, tough combination john that's a tough combo he does uh, not sell it well at the top of his brace it's, exact, it's exactly what you outlined and it's yeah drastically different than the what 5 10 176 pound tank dial that we talked about oh, where like his footwork on comebacks or hitches or out routes does not strike fear into corners at all yeah. they stick close to him they run the route for him yeah. even if he does have like one or two yards of separation somehow he's like slow and lethargic to work back to the football and so these corners yeah. then close it and beat him run the route for him I mean, 27 of 72 targets were contested last year. He simply had too difficult of a time creating space. And again, it goes back to exactly what we saw at TCU. For a big guy, for an X wide receiver frame, he does not have the contested catch confidence, physicality, no. ball tracking right now to be a star in that area. And where a lot of people pointed to where he's going to succeed early at the NFL level was his yards after catch capabilities. You and I were far more concerned about that than everyone else because yeah. I, I didn't see the movement that would translate to the same in the same manner that mm. people were you know putting the the figures on him if, if yes. that makes sense yeah, now spreadsheets. yes spreadsheets <laughs> i think he was left off to dry a little bit oh for where sure. it was pretty clear that this team knew that they were going to move on from mike williams after this past season and for some reason they like future planned this thing and felt like okay because of that draft class there weren't that many big body outside wide receiver dudes mm -hmm. he was the one in the first round and so they probably were like we're going to take all of 2024 and teach this guy how to play football well mike williams goes down he's forced to play and this is what you saw and now it's a totally new coaching staff right. so i He's just going to have to like learn how to play the position. As simple as that statement is, that is what yeah. has to happen for him to be a legit NFL wide receiver. Now he's very young. He's an early declare, um, and he does have like the size and speed that we're looking for for the position. Where I would like to see him this year, prove to the corners that are defending him that you can just run right by him. Screw the in breaking routes. Don't even try to become the number one target in the pass game. Just prove that you have this the ability to run right by people. So at least these corners can be scared of something. And then that's when you can start getting a, a couple more hitch routes that are kind of free completions and that type of stuff. But like him trying to like turn into a number one target to me would it'd be asking way too much. Like to me, I'd rather see five targets per game and they are, he's got a 20 a dot and we're just trying to prove to these corners that he has the juice 
to win downfield, especially now that we have the context. Lad McConkey like could not be a different type of player more than Quentin Johnson. Like he's going to do all the fun stuff. He's I mean, be precision, the guy. all of it. Oh man, he's going to run away with targets in this offense. It's not even yeah. close. Well, so let's dive into this offense from that wide receiver room a little bit because. When a new GM and new head coach, especially with the authority that Harpo has, like I think we got to pay attention to what moves they make and which ones they don't. Obviously, they take Lad McConkey at the top of round two. Josh Palmer is still there, entering a contract year. Lad McConkey is being drafted as the wide receiver 39. Josh Palmer, wide receiver 58. QJ is the next at wide receiver 66. And they go out and spend a pretty decent amount of money on DJ Chark, who I thought was the worst outside veteran wide receiver at X yeah. this past season pretty similar um, to QJ <laughs> as wide receiver 86. So again, if they bring him in and just want to trot him out there as this veteran guy that kind of knows what he's doing, don't get me started on a DJ chart conversation. Right. Um, then again, that brings us back to Quentin Johnston as being a developmental type pick because you have Josh Palmer who can do the outside inside type stuff. And the same thing with Lad McConkey. Is that fair? I think that's what's going to happen here. Every single snap that DJ Chark plays ahead of Quentin Johnson is more and more evidence that this thing is going bad. So, like, pay attention in training camp. Like, if Chark's ahead of Quentin Johnson, that is not a good look because, like you just mentioned, w watching Bryce Young for the, for the quarterback video of this, the DJ Chark stuff, it's, it's not good. So, if, if he's playing over Quentin Johnson at all, at any point, that's not good. So, yeah, um, I, I I don't have that much optimism. I don't know what to say. Next, maybe the forgotten man of this wide receiver group a little bit. Michael Wilson, wide receiver 57 in points per game this past season with the Arizona Cardinals. One top 20 scoring wide receiver week. He is being drafted as wide receiver 75 right now on underdog fantasy just for some raw numbers out there for the people. 13 games played, 58 targets, 38 receptions, 565 yards, and three scores. What do you think of Michael Wilson? He's kind of a stomper out in the route. He's not super fluid. He's a big body outside receiver. There was a couple times where, though, he was able to turn some flash on and win on some double moves. And then I think his best thing was so he made some really impressive contested catches. Some of them in the end zone, some of them down the field near the sideline. But to me, like that's that's something. If you can win in that area, then you're a number three like starter on the outside and you, obviously Marvin Harrison can do everything. If the, he just going to be a contested catch guy down the field as the distant number two or distant number three, I think that he can do that. The there's the stompiness and yeah. the lack of like fluidity is going to come back and like put a cap on this thing. But for somebody in that ex defined role, like he's like a better version of like what Alec Pierce was trying to be or something like that. I should have mentioned the top that you and I watch these separately and never share our notes until we hop on here. But I'm glad that you and I kind of see Michael Wilson in the same way. In somewhat of a similar fashion to what we just said about Quentin Johnston, Michael Wilson can be pretty slow in his breaks. He looks like he's in sand at some of those points. Like there was this one rep against Emmanuel Forbes that he was open on a break around the outside, open on a post. Some space was created. And then on the cut, it gets eaten up because, yeah. again, that got a bit stompy, as yep. you put it. But when he does live in those contested situations, those tight spaces along the sideline outside breakers, he did make physical grabs mm -hmm. through contact. Now, that style of game, I think, has like a pretty thin margin to it. Like it either works or it doesn't yeah. in those contested situations. But if we look at this Cardinals team where you and I, I'll just say myself, liked facets of Drew Petzing's offense this past season, right? Even going from Same. Josh Dobbs to Kyler Murray. We know that it's Marvin Harrison. We know, especially, it's Trey McBride. After that, Michael Wilson just has to hold off of what Zay Jones is now, mm -hmm. and that's it to be out mm -hmm. there in two wide receiver sets. That's pretty yeah. fair. Yeah, I'm drafting some Michael Wilson after after watching him there. Uh, I don't think I have full contract details on on Zay Jones, which is never a good sign. Like that, he's been out there, and like it's hard to find the contract details. It probably means there's not a lot of guaranteed money. So. Yeah, I think that they're going to try to make Michael Wilson the number two uh, wide receiver out there. Now, like you said, this offense is about the tight ends. Trey McBride is very good. Marvin Harrison, obviously very good. Um, and they'll run the ball plenty in this offense as well. So he's going to be a better and best ball only type of guy out there. But he proved that he can make some plays down the field and near the sideline. And 
I've seen Kyler Murray throw some beautiful passes way down the field in those situations. So all we're looking for are three games that we can get top 25 finishes this year where he has a 70 yards and a touchdown. I think that Michael Wilson could do that. So like for he's basically one of the last receivers I'm willing to draft in best ball. I can see the role. I can see how he wins. Him and Demarcus fantasy. Robinson. <laughs> too much to Marcus Robinson. It's, it's, it's scaring me over here. Uh, I, I, I challenge you all in this last video to move no. to Marcus Robinson up to around this ADP at 170. And it's still like 196. It <laughs> yeah. still hasn't moved at all. What are you people doing? Yeah. Draft so I'll, an underdog. I'll draft some Michael Wilson. He's not, there's some times where he's flashy. There's a couple of times where he went on double moves, but for the most part, it's the, the plays that you said against like Emmanuel Forbes, where the creation or this, the separation is not being created. And if it does create, It'll get closed in a second, but he'll dunk on you as well, which I like. Yeah. Uh, and trust me, if the Cardinals wanted to make Greg Dorch more of a thing, I would be all for it. I'd be on that train. Uh, it doesn't seem like getting Dorched is high on the list right now. Of but who's the slot the receiver? Thing. Is it not still I mean, Greg Dorch? <laughs> yes, it is. I think they're going to run a lot of two tight end sets, to be honest with you, with Trey yeah. McBride and, and Tip Ryman. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, again, wide receiver 75. And he, Michael Wilson was very like maybe late stage Marvin Jones ish to me. Okay. Okay. You know, there's a kind of Marvin had from him. a little bit more juice, but the yeah. same exact type of profile though. Yeah. And Marvin Jones was like classic better in best ball 70th best wide receiver in drafts. All right. We'll keep it moving next. The people's favorite Denver Broncos, Marvin Mims drafted as wide receiver 76 right now on underdog last year. He was the wide receiver 96 in points per game, again, despite him being the people's favorite out there, he had two top 20 finishes, Hayden, and those are actually week two and week three of the NFL season, yeah. and then he faded away into the sunset. Just some raw stats quickly. Just 22 receptions on 33 targets, 377 yards, which equaled 17 yards per reception, and one touchdown. And unfortunately, one of those long touchdowns was just completely just like broken coverage. So like... He didn't necessarily do anything on it. He just caught the ball down the field, scored a long touchdown. So, like, I was, like, looking for any consistency in his game, and I didn't see any. Uh, 30% of his targets were screens. So, if you're, like, looking at the spreadsheets, he's like, oh, his targets per route run or whatever. It's because he wouldn't be on the field because he can't beat press man coverage. He's too tiny. Uh, and there's a development to his game that hasn't been created yet. So, they would get him on the field a couple times. They throw a couple screens to him. They would try to get a deep deep shot down the sideline. He made a couple of them. He a couple broken plays, let's some big, big plays as well. Um, but it's basically hitches and goes and screens. Those yep. are the three routes. So coming, uh, into the NFL at Oklahoma, it was a lot of option routes from the slot. Some, some go routes from the slot. But if you go back and watch our video to me, he was always a developmental guy and like him being exactly that as a rookie was not a surprise to me. There's a lot of mouths to feed in Denver, there's like five guys actually have a chance to playing time. Now, none of them are good, but there's like five or six names that you can kind of point to. I'm not sure if he's going to be a full-time player this year yeah. as well, even with Jerry Judy um, opening up some slot uh, snaps. What's fascinating is Sean Payton typically sticks with his dudes, you know? And in his first draft for the Denver Broncos, he trades up into the second round for Marvin Mims and like barely nice. plays him. And then we don't know what that is heading into year two because since then, you know, they drafted a falling Troy Franklin, I believe in round four. Then they go out and give Josh Reynolds a contract. You still have Cortland Sutton out there and Tim Patrick might be coming back onto the field after multiple mm -hmm. major injuries. But it's what you said. He had 11 targets behind the line of scrimmage, 11 targets from one to 19 yards, and then 13 targets, 20 plus yards down the field. Like 35 total targets just isn't enough to grade, especially one with like that kind of target distribution. And all you can say now of who he is. He's a vertical role player and yeah. we'll see, we'll dive into it. Cause we love it. The preseason usage and see if he's out there and see if we see something different. But right now that's just the mindset that I have is that he's a vertical role player. Yeah. And if that's the case, even like wide receiver 76 for me. No yeah. No, thanks. I have like two twenty right next to the Tim Patrick's and those type of guys. I, I don't see a full-time player here. And then the other thing in my notes and I mean, like you said, there's only what 35 targets to go off of here. He just didn't seem like a four three eight guy to me. Like Tank Dell, where I was like watching, like, I was like he's way faster than his forty time. To me, Marvin Mims, I just didn't see that at the time. And I'm not sure if that was just because he was just kind of like not winning initially, and then it's like all of a sudden you're kind of like trying to get back onto where you're supposed to be on your route. 
and it was just like too late. But there was not some like, wow, like that's Rashid Shahid. There he goes. Like, I just didn't get that type of feel from Marvin Mims. The juice didn't pop for you, is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Okay, we'll keep it moving with a very different player than this. Demario Douglas, pop of the New England Patriots. He's wide receiver 82 on underdog. Wide receiver 71 this past season in points per game. Zero top 20 finishes, which is, I wouldn't say surprising, but maybe doesn't doesn't highlight perfectly that he was getting some level of volume because right. of where he plays on the field. He had 14 games, 79 targets, 49 receptions, 561 yards, and zero touchdowns. My question to you, can he be Drake May's Josh Downs? I don't think so. I thought he was more manufactured than what Josh yeah. Downs is. And I'm not I think sure. There's like a, a DeMario Douglas in every single draft. Yeah, there is. And it's just, He's a fine player, like in this specific role, but I think last year is going to be his most productive season just because there's like more bodies that are going to be out there. And I, I, don't, I haven't sorted out exactly how they're going to rotate guys into the slot and to the outside because basically all of the guys on, on the Patriots, they can play some slot. We'll see if Juju Smith Schuster is on the roster still. Like we'll see if Jalen Polk is going to be an outside or inside guy. I know that Baker is going to be an outside guy, but Kendrick Bourne could be inside outside. I don't know. Tyquan Thornton, if he's going to be out there, I don't know. I, he's like sets. not. Yeah. And the Patriots are going to stink anyways on offense. So like for fantasy purposes, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, the offense is going to stink. The, the team might be okay. The team might be feisty, but the offense is probably going to stink. I'm drafting a good amount of Ramondre. So hopefully the running game. Is well, okay too. Same. And I, I draft some Drake may as well. It's like, by, by the way, like the last round. Um, but yeah, in terms of pop Douglas, he's a fine player, but like, I don't see how he's going to win in like real receiver routes. Really, Yeah. Like I don't want to sound dismissive, but there's just not a lot to his game. It's like quick slant option route or press vertical and break off of it. It's kind of yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And he's not going to be big and like breaking a bunch of tackles and no. red zone. Yeah. It's like, he's fine. Okay. We'll finish up with three names that frequently are not sometimes are being drafted out there. First one is Jonathan Mingo of the Panthers, wide receiver 120 right now on underdog. Uh, he was wide receiver 91 this past season. Uh, zero top 20 finishes, which is pretty obvious when you mention where he finished on a points per game basis. Uh, just raw numbers. He did play 15 games, 85 targets, 43 receptions, 418 yards. I was an advocate of Jonathan Mingo heading into last year's NFL draft. Um, I think you can tell Hayden as the season went along, I just like did not want to speak about Jonathan Mingo because I actually Why? think a lot of the same issues that we talked about with Quentin Johnson can be applied to Jonathan Mingo. Yeah. In my notes, like I had with Quentin Johnson, where is the athleticism? Like he's supposed to yeah. be an athletic guy. Like just didn't see it. Can't he looks shake. stuck in the mud at the top of his yeah. route so often. There's just like no, is there's a predictableness to his, his game. There's just no ability for him to create separation. Um, and then also like talk about if he hands and feet near the sideline, like obviously there's that one where like, I don't even know what happens <laughs> near the sideline, Titans but that game. wasn't the only, that was not even the only time no, there was where, that like, saints one where he was caught at like the, th or caught at the three yard line. And instead of just going to the front pylon, he works yeah. continuing backwards and doesn't even try to go to the end zone. Like just no feel for area and, no. and, and zones or anything. Nothing. And it's over for Mingo, I think. So maybe I think what could happen here is he is the fourth wide receiver on this team this year yeah, and works as, and maybe evolves into a flanker slash slot player and slot might be a power slot style, which could sure. fit his game maybe a bit more. Um, I just don't think you can line him up outside the numbers on the outside and ask him to win yeah. with like route manipulation because he frequently was the slowest person to get downfield versus yeah. press coverage on a team that was full of slow wide receivers. He's just like still learning how to play the position. But now Deontay Johnson, who offers a little bit more explosiveness, but it's like not like going crazy down the field and Adam feeling like they still need somebody to be that downfield guy. Maybe it's Xavier Leggett, but he, the way that they were kind of talking about, no, him, it's going to be Leggett. Leggett's going to be the downfield guy. Yeah. They were talking about like, giving him like only so many types of routes and all that type of stuff. So it's still a work in progress out there. I think that when I say it's over for Mingo, like he's going to be a number three, number four guy, but like him turning he's gonna into see a massive decrease in snaps, unless they're like a major injuries hit. 
if he's going to be a big slot, like we said that he doesn't have good feel, like what's the point of being a big slot? Yeah. It's a learning year. I yeah. think for Jonathan Domingo, we need to try to learn on the job. And I think it's one of those cases where like he just didn't. And I think it's really fair to say that a bunch of those positions were probably poorly coached. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next one. I'm actually intrigued by Jalen Hyatt right now. Hayden okay. Jalen Hyatt is being drafted on underdog as the wide receiver 93 213 ADP at the moment. Just some counting stats here for Jalen Hyatt, 40 targets, just 23 receptions, 373 yards, zero touchdowns. Fade, deep post, hitch, double move. Yep. was the name of his game. But can that hit differently in 2024 yep. than it did in 2023? In my notes, I said lots of deep prayers. There were so many throws that were just like either not even close or had no business being thrown to Jalen Hyatt. He was a slot guy at... Uh, in the Vols offense, but he was 90% outside with the Giants. Now, the reason why he was in the slot and why a lot of people thought he was going to be a vertical slot option was because he was struggle against press man coverage, and that was definitely the case this year. But on certain type of looks, alerts, um, you got a big post route on the, uh, the, the other side of the field, I think that Jalen Hyatt is going to be a little bit better than what his stats was showcasing there. There's one thing, I'm not sure if you saw the same thing, his feet near the sideline, like he would get his toes down in on a lot of these like plays. I did not think that he was going to have, well, he had like no experience in, on those type of looks, but he was able to do that. And there was a couple, Daniel Jones talked about it uh, in the Super Bowl where he made a big, big play down the field, the contested catch situation. Uh, so that I wasn't necessarily expecting that. But last year, there's just so many wasted plays on the Giants. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. There's still, I think, a lot of volume to go around in this offense outside Malik neighbors. And this is one of the funnier teams to look at from a drafting perspective, because you have Malik neighbors, who's the 29th overall pick right now. And you don't have another pass catcher on this team going yeah. until the 182nd overall pick. Right. And that is Wandale Robinson at wide receiver 79. Darius Slayton is wide receiver 92. Jalen Hyatt is wide receiver 93. At worst, I think Jalen Hyatt is a, role-playing vertical downfield weapon on a team that I expect to be more vertical than we've seen mm -hmm. for the last two seasons. You mentioned the sideline awareness that he showed. I still think he had some really like awkward drops and he's definitely super skinny out there on yes. the field, but like maybe this is one of those players that we see improvement in August and in the mm -hmm. preseason. And if that's the case and he earns like two wide receiver work and sets or even three wide receiver stuff on a team that maybe stays healthy at quarterback and along the offensive line. I don't want to like get two over my skis here, but at least where he's being drafted right now. And if I need like my eighth wide receiver that I haven't drafted yet and Demarcus Robinson is gone, I'll probably take Jalen Hyatt in the last round. Yeah. Yeah. I draft Darius Slayton, who's the ex receiver on this team. And I draft Jalen Hyatt if I'm looking for my seventh or eighth wide receiver in these builds. So I, I see the same exact thing. I think that he was a developmental player coming in and he's still super young and he did some things that you didn't necessarily see on a couple of his snaps in the pros. So I think that I think there's a chance that there's a little bit more here. Um, third round player, but I, I liked him better than a lot of the second rounders that were drafted ahead of him in the NFL draft. Um, and I, I do wonder if maybe the 89% rate outside is too much and that like we got to remove Wandell Robinson from the field on, on occasion, get, get him into the slot. Obviously Malik neighbor is also going to do that as well. So I think he's going to be in a rotation. He's going to be a role player, but there is a better in best ball to his profile. And um, I did see some, some development as a rookie versus as a college player. Okay. We'll close with AT Perry of the New Orleans saints, because the conversation is somewhat similar to what we just had with the giants where Chris Olave is going as the 18th overall players, wide receiver 12, Rashid Shahid's going as 117, wide receiver 55. Then it's AT Perry at 213 overall, wide receiver 94. Um, he had just 12 receptions on 20 targets. <laughs> What'd you see from AT Perry, if anything? I saw some rookie mistakes. Like there's this one um, at the goal line. It was supposed to be um, a fade route to him and he ran a slant, slant route. <laughs> it was like almost an interception. That was really bad. I think there's reasons why he wasn't on the field very often. So I think there's like a, a learning curve that AT Perry had to go through. Now on his best plays, he's a red zone threat. He is somebody that could win 
down the field and contested catches near the sideline, like a jump ball type of guy, I would be stunned if he's going to be anything more than that. Just a contested catch, big outside receiver. Um, but something I tweeted out just the other day is I was looking at it. Chris Olave, eight dots, like 14. Uh, then we have Rashid Shaheed, his ADOTs like 17. AT Perry's is A dot 18. Who's who's getting the ball on the underneath snaps? This is a new offense, Clint Kubiak. Like, this is not like only downfield snaps. Like one of these guys is gonna turn into an underneath receiver. I know it's not gonna be AT Perry, but like just watching AT Perry made me like try to like think like is Rashid Shaheed gonna be somebody that's gonna be like winning more underneath? Because you can't just have three guys who only get the ball deep downfield in your three wide receiver set lineup. And I know that AT Perry is not going to do that. So uh, watching AT Perry, ironically, made me more optimistic uh, for Rashid Shaheed. I'd love it to be tight end 21 Juwan Johnson. But well, I, if you look at my best ball exposures, I would also love it to be Juwan. We'll talk about that in our uh, tight end sleepers and the sleeper series that comes out. And by the way, speaking of series this week, as you can tell, it's our second year breakout. We just completed the wide receiver one. If you, if you got this far, go watch the running backs, quarterbacks, tight end videos that we have on the way as well. Shout out to all of you for watching, subscribing. It's a fun time of year. And I love, you know, the prediction aspect, the player take aspect, and the like top down overview. Because again, we get lost in the tidal wave that is the NFL season. And it's the perfect time to, re to review and sit back and, and try to reflect on what these players mm -hmm. were and what they could be in the future. Okay, that does it. Shout out to producer Weaves for making us look good on this video. And we'll catch you on the next one, up the villa.